I'll try it again. There we go. <laughs> and I'll say it again. Good evening, and uh, welcome to the Mob Museum. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we, you know, I really appreciate the turnout for our event tonight. You know, there's so many competing events going on in Las Vegas and on television and whatnot that I, I recognize people are making choices and just so great that you've chosen to come down to our museum. I think we've got a, a great program uh, tonight. What I, what I see in the audience are, is like a lot of people who've been in Las Vegas a long time and who appreciate the history of our city and who uh, love to sort of remember and to learn more about uh, you know the city and the people in it and and the things that happened and and to recollect about you know what was good what wasn't so good but you know I think so many people who live here have lived here a long time uh, you know look back fondly on the earlier times here and it's not that we don't like what we're doing today but you know Las Vegas was a little bit different in the 1950s 1960s and 70s and that's what we will be focusing on tonight so Thursday will mark the 50th anniversary of the opening of Circus Circus, the iconic casino on the north end of the Strip. Um, for some of us here, it may be hard to believe that the opening of Circus Circus happened half a century ago. Uh, for others, that probably seems like ancient history. So it just depends on your perspective. Uh, Circus Circus has a fascinating story, and we're going to explore it with this incredible group of individuals we've assembled here uh, who are deeply involved in Circus Circus in one way or another. I'll start by introducing the panel, and I'm going to start on, my, on the far right, the audience's far right. Uh, David Schwartz is director of the Center for Gaming Research at UNLV. He studies the history of gambling, the current state of the gaming industry, and related issues. He has written several books, including Grandissimo, the first emperor of Las Vegas, which will is the focal point of this talk, and Roll the Bones, The History of Gambling. He's a regular contributor to Forbes.com on the Las Vegas and Gambling Beat. Born and raised in Atlantic City, Schwartz earned his bachelor's and master's wow. degrees from the University of Pennsylvania and earned his doctorate in U.S. history from UCLA. Please welcome David Schwartz. Damn. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Next to David is Mike Sloan. Mike Sloan is Senior Vice President of Government Relations for Fertitta Entertainment, responsible for local, state, and federal government relations and all legislative activities involving Fertitta Entertainment or Station Casinos. He started out as a reporter for the Las Vegas Review Journal and then press secretary to U.S. Senator Alan Bible. He was Senior Vice President and General Counsel with Circus Circus Enterprises, later known as Mandalay Resort Group, for 20 years. He is a graduate of UNLV and George Washington University Law School. Please welcome Mike Sloan. Thank you. Diana Bennett started her career in the gaming industry working for her father, Bill Bennett. As part of his leadership team, she opened and operated multiple gaming operations in Las Vegas and Laughlin. Today, she is CEO and co-founder of Paragon Gaming, a developer and operator of gaming-based properties. Under the leadership of Diana and co-founder Scott Menke, Paragon manages several casino properties in Canada. Please welcome Diana Bennett. Go, step over myself. <laughs> Stanley Mallon was born in Kansas City, Missouri in 1923. He served three years in the Army in the South Pacific during World War II. He then graduated from the University of Missouri, where he met none other than Jay Sarno. Together, they worked as tile contractors in Miami and then developed residential and commercial real estate in Atlanta and Dallas. After a trip to Las Vegas in 1961, they envisioned a themed hotel, Caesars Palace, which opened in 1966. Wow. They followed up with Circus Circus in 1968. After selling the latter property, Mallon retired. In the years since, he has been a noted philanthropist. The early childhood center at Temple Beth Shalom is named for Mallon and his wife, Sandra. Please welcome Stan Mallon. <laughs> Last but not least, in any way, is uh, Jay Sarno, Jr. 
I should say J. Cameron Sarno, generally referred to as J. Sarno Jr., was born in Atlanta and moved to Las Vegas in 1965 when his family relocated here because his father was building Caesar's Palace. In 1987, Jay founded Crescent Design, Inc. in San Diego. Um, Crescent originally was in the consulting design business for casino gaming machinery, but it has since evolved to become a world leader in the design and production of specialized automation and test equipment used primarily by the medical device industry. Jay is a member of the North Coast Repertory Theater Board of Directors. He and his wife, Julie, are involved with many local and regional theaters and other charities. Please welcome Jay Sarno, Jr. Now, now, as always, we're going to have a, a conversation up here. It's kind of a talk show format, kind of very casual and comfortable conversation about the history of Circus Circus. Afterward, we're going to have a Q&A session with the audience in which you get to ask questions, uh, whatever you want. Uh, we'll, we'll open the floor to questions. We're going to bring a microphone around once you raise your hand and you're, you're picked, just like in school. Uh, the microphone will be brought around and... Uh, then you can speak into the microphone because we need the people on the live stream to hear you and for the recording. Uh, very important. Um, also, after we're done uh, with the Q&A, uh, we're going to head down to the d speakeasy and distillery. And there's two, at least two reasons to go down there. One is <laughs> if you were given a wooden nickel uh, before, did anybody get those? Those are, uh, give you a great discount down in the, in the speakeasy. So I definitely want to take advantage of that. Um, now, and more specifically to the purposes of our talk tonight, uh, David Schwartz is going to be selling and signing copies of his book, Grandissimo, which is a, a fine uh, biography of Jay Sarno and, and a look at Las Vegas during that era. So uh, please head on down to the Speakeasy and Distillery after the event. I think Jay Sarno uh, Jr. is also going to be hanging out, so you can ask questions of him and, and, and perhaps some other people in the audience who we'll talk about. In a little bit. And I'm giving so. away books, so. Well, and let's not forget, uh, that's exactly right. So Diana has brought with her copies of a biography, essentially, of her father, Bill Bennett. Um, actually, was the editor of this book many years ago, so I'm very proud of it. And she's actually giving those away tonight. So you can walk away with one either signed by Diana or anyone okay. else want to have sign it. And uh, so that's very generous. Thank you for that. That is a great book. So we're going, to, we're going to start, um, what I want to do is sort of break this into two sections, uh, that's my goal, uh, that we'll, we'll kind of talk about the history of Circus Circus chronologically first, and I'll hit each of the panelists and they'll contribute their, their piece to that story, and then we'll open it up into other more general questions and, and, uh, and commentary. And all along, I encourage the panelists to chip in, if, even if you aren't called on. If you have something interesting to say, please... Uh, please go ahead and, and uh, pipe up. Everybody has a microphone and they're free to use it. <laughs> so Stan, um, as a senior fellow here on the panel and the person who was so integral to this, this story, um, can you describe the origins of your partnership with Jay Sarno and the development of Caesars and Circus Circus, just in general? Well, I met Jay in college at the University of Missouri. Uh, we, we went in business in, in Atlanta and we went on a junket, came on a junket to Las Vegas. And we, we thought there was not a decent hotel here. So that's, that was the genesis of, of uh, Caesar's Palace. And after Caesar's, we kind of hit lightning in a bottle, they say. We made, we made a nice piece of change. So we decided to build, and he decided, he was his brainchild to build Circus Circus. I went along because I thought, well, it's easy money making gaming after Caesars. So that's the, 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 the how Circus started. And you, re, you ended up relocating to Las Vegas and, and you were dedicated to the gaming industry. I'm sorry, so what? <laughs> you, uh, you relocated to Las Vegas and you were involved with Caesars in what way? I, I did not live here with Caesars. I was living in Atlanta. I was on the board of directors. I did not work there. We just met from time to time. When we started Circus Circus, I moved here then, 1968. Excellent. So that's a good uh, way to get us to Circus Circus, the development of Circus Circus. Jay, if, can you talk about your dad, Jay Sarno, a little bit? What he was like 
and maybe some of your boyhood memories of Circus Circus. Well, what I, what I remember, uh, I, was, I was 10 years old when Circus Circus first opened. I was 13 years old when I first went to work there. This is my employee badge, um, 46 <laughs> years ago, 47 years ago. Um, ran the bumper car ride, and um, it, was, it was a pretty interesting situation to grow up and learn what the mechanics were of bringing these kinds of things into existence. And between, my father had no hesitation to have uh, I or any, my siblings are here, Freddie, my brother, and my sister, September, and Heidi, and um, we could be present in the middle of anything he was doing, and he was... He was very accepting in the sense that he was so oblivious to everything. He didn't know where we were anyway. So um, <laughs> we could be in the middle of the process, whether it was at an architect's office or on the site and climbing in trenches and climbing on cranes. And so we had a front row seat to the whole process, um, being in the design office, listening to discussions about des the design process, um, and growing up with a, with a very strong sense that it's not straightforward, it's not orderly, it's certainly not his way of doing it. I think for some people it is, certainly his way wasn't. He was a brilliant man. Um, I, used to, I used to think that one of the most important jobs Stan pl played was to constantly tell my father, no, that won't work. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's too expensive, that's illegal, we can't do that. You know? um, and Stan was kind of the moderating voice of reason in so many of these discussions. But it was, a, it was a real interesting environment to grow up in and be able to, to observe. And certainly, it was, even as a kid, it was clear how different Caesars and Circus were. And as I've gotten older, what I've come to realize is the real sort of essential truth here is that if you contrast the two big projects he, he, he did here, Caesars Palace was incredibly innovative in terms of the design concepts, in terms of taking a theme and creating a deep immersive theme experience, a la Disney. Um, and in terms of the, the way that theme was applied with the, the level of materials and quality and opulence and, and just raising the bar as far as what that experience was. But the business model of it was conventional. It followed the standard pattern Las Vegas properties followed. It had a showroom, it had a pool, it had a casino, it had a gourmet room, a coffee shop. It was templated right off of the standard working model, and it was a success from the start. As Stan said, they, they struck it. It was, it was a goer from the beginning. It was done right. Circus, on the other hand, I used to refer to it as uh, the Nevada State Gaming Research Laboratory because <laughs> it, Circus completely tossed out the business model. Here was a property that you entered on the second floor, kids were welcomed, you charged admission. There were no rooms. There was no expensive uh, entertainment as far as big time names. The entertainment was immersive. You were literally you know, at the casino table and people were over your head and people were jumping out of the ceiling and landing on the floor on mattresses. And, and, it, was, it, was, um, and it also was extremely innovative in terms of the fraction of floor space de dedicated to slot machines because my dad recognized in a very early way that the slots were much more productive. And in those days, casinos had gaming in the middle and the slots wrapped around. And the standard model was that men were at the tables where wives needed a place to be occupied. And so Circus was this amazing place. And for the most part, it didn't work. Um, yeah. I want to ask uh, David to elaborate on this sort of, in the, in the historical context of the times in Las Vegas, um, Caesar's Palace, very successful, Circus, and we'll get into this in more depth, but not so successful, at least at first. Um, uh, what, was the, what was the context of this? I mean, how, what was happening in Las Vegas at that time, and, and why was Circus struggling at first? Well, in those years, you have the first move of the corporate uh, companies into Las Vegas with Hilton, Kirk Krikorian's building the International right around this time which is, was for the time a huge 1,500-room resort. So you really have a lot of money coming into Las Vegas. Uh, Jace Arno and, and Stan, too, didn't have that kind of capital. So they really had to be very entrepreneurial, very improvisatory, trying to get something together. And like Jay said, 
it really was in a lot of ways ahead of its time with the focus on slot machines. That really was going to be the future. How did, how did, why didn't people figure that out? He was really the first one to figure that out, right? Yeah, you know, a lot of it also comes down to the technological changes in the slots, which I know Jay could talk about. It, I won't bore you with all the details, but basically they become a lot more entertaining to play, and you can win a lot more money in them, and that's when people really start playing them more. Stan, in your mind, uh, um, what were the reasons behind uh, Circus's early financial struggles? We were undercapitalized. We had a mortgage, we had a second mortgage, and a lot of loans that we were fighting all the time to, to make payments. Uh, and the business didn't, didn't uh, grow as we thought it would. We, when we opened, we didn't have any rooms. We opened just a casino. We later built 400 rooms. That helped a lot. And uh, we were getting along. We were making it pretty well until we got in some litigation with the uh, IRS. We'll get back, we'll get back to that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, Jay, you kind of touched on a couple of these things already, but what were, the, in your mind, the fundamental, like, maybe even structural problems with, the, with Circus at that in those early years? Well, the, my, my dad's assumption was that he was going to create a product so appealing that he was going to take the people staying in the rooms in other hotels and make them come down the street. That was an assumption that was um, not really analytically tested, and it proved to be not right. And that's why, as Stan pointed out, by 72, we had opened up the first 400-room tower. Um, the other thing is that it didn't really, it wasn't a property that attracted a lot of gamblers on the high end of the dollar spectrum. It was designed to sort of make it up in volume, if you can ex understand that expression. Um, and I don't know the numbers, but we also had the, the problem of in, in those days when you borrowed money from the Teamsters, you had this cash leak problem. And that contributed, <laughs> that contributed to your difficulties. And, and in my opinion, I'm trying to be objective here. I mean, I was joking with you earlier that the, the name Circus Circus to me refers to the management style of the hotel. <laughs> it, it was chaotically run. Um, and I, I think during the time my, my father and, and others were running it, is it, they simply could not get the, 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 the revenues up to the point where, and the cost down to where it, it met and really became efficient. And it wasn't until he was, he, it was leased out to the Bills, to Diane's uh, father and Mr. Pennington, that they were the ones who really masterfully figured out how to make Circus Circus work. So I really think that to a larger reason the Circus Circus is here after 50 years, which is a major achievement in Las Vegas, and it's not been bulldozed, really, you can't give enough credit to, to Mr. Bennett and Mr. Pennington for achieving that. Absolutely, and we're going to turn to them momentarily. David, um, Teamsters Union in Las Vegas, obviously it was very influential through its loans for casino development. Can you kind of explain the Teamsters Union at that time and its impact on Circus? Certainly. At the time, it was really hard to borrow money if you wanted to build a casino in Las Vegas because building a casino in Las Vegas is a very risky proposition for a lot of reasons. The Teamsters Union under Jimmy Hoffa were one organization that would loan money to people who wanted to build casinos. As time went on, though, there were a lot of strings attached. You'd have to appoint certain people in the casino. One of those folks who showed oh, up bad. at Uncle my Uncle Jim. Circus Circus to run the gift shop was Tony Spilatro, who <laughs> probably needs no introduction among this crowd. And you can ima I imagine he wasn't there just to sell the snow globes, and he was looking at <laughs> something And so just a quick note on, on the Teamsters Union and Jimmy Hoffa. It fits right into the building we're in. Uh, did You knew Jimmy Hoffa a little bit. My Uncle Jim. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I found out years later that my father took me on all these trips because my mother was of the uh, 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 hypothesis was that if he traveled with me, the FBI wouldn't follow him because it looked like a missile father. <laughs> but we went all kinds of trips and met all sorts of people. And um, my Uncle Jim, whether it was going to Miami or his place in, in, outside of Flint, Michigan. And um, yeah, I was always around those folks and didn't know what they did or why they, we, I was there. I just went for the plane ride, you know. But. Yeah. Very good. So, Stan, to get back to your, your point about um, 
an encounter with an investigation. So the, the problem that sort of led to you turning over Circus Circus to Bill Bennett was the IRS, is that right? Correct. We had some litigation with the IRS. Uh, and at the conclusion of it, the Gaming Control Board very strongly suggested we divest ourselves. <laughs> uh, Bennett, Bill Bennett and Pennington came. I don't know quite exactly how they came about, but they were a godsend. We leased the operation to them and with an option to buy, which they exercised after about five years. Uh, they did very well. They were better operators than we were. Absolutely. Perfect. So that, that's a great segue for Diana. To um, If you could talk a little bit about your dad. And um, what I'm curious about is, you know, certainly what he was like, like um, not only as uh, a dad, but as a, as a casino operator. Um, and, and what things do you believe he brought to the table that helped Circus Circus succeed under his uh, management? Well, to start with, when we lived in Arizona, my father had a chain of furniture stores. Um, and when he came into the gaming side, he had in his mind that running a casino was no different than running a furniture store. You were going to give people great service, a great product, at a great price. And if you always lived by those three things, you were going to succeed. So whereas it might have been rather chaotic uh, before, he came in and was very organized and very deliberate in everything that he did. And Mr. Pennington and my father had become friends um, meeting up earlier. Mr. Pennington had a background with oil and so had some money to invest. My father had uh, been general manager of the Mint downtown, the Sahara, and then ran all of Del Webb's properties. And then he decided he really didn't like telling other general managers how to run their joints. So there were 21 machines out on the market. The gaming control board didn't like the program and ordered to be all sold. And he, uh, he and Mr. Pennington bought them all up, started their own slot route, and then the opportunity came around for Circus Circus. And they were there. So... I have been raised under the belief that running a casino is not brain science, I mean, surgery. It's just logical and sensical, and you do the same things you would do in your everyday life. And that is make sure that your product is the best that it can be. And even if you're selling $19 rooms, those rooms are going to be clean and good and always available. And when he got to the point where he was actually selling out all the rooms, he came up with the logo of uh, rooms available. If not, we place you. And that became a huge bonus for us because we had a reservation system right there at the front desk. And if we were sold out, we got them rooms someplace else. Um, a very funny story along that line was one time we were sold out and we booked people at the Desert Inn across the street. Burton Cohen happened to be general manager of the Desert Inn at the time. And the people then wrote my father a letter and said they'd come to circus. It was crazy busy. They couldn't get a room. He booked them across the street at the Desert Inn. And they wanted to thank him because it was so quiet and so peaceful at the Desert Inn. <laughs> <laughs> and they could play any machine they wanted and had a great time. So he wanted to thank my father for what they did. So, of course, my father signed it on the bottom and sent it over to Burton and said, you know, these people liked your place. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, and, and so it, it was just kind of a lot of the things that had been done. I mean, we had chickens that were on hot plates. Um, so you put in a quarter and the chickens would dance because their feet were being burned. Not a very fun thing to do. Um, and he just wanted to make sure he believed, just like your father did, that slots were going to be it. And he learned that from Benny Benyon when he ran the Mint. Uh, Benny Benyon told him everything he could about slots and that slots um, were going to be the thing. It was no longer going to be your brother-in-law running slots so that the women could play. Um, so he had strong belief in, in his slot machines. And he had a strong belief in bringing in the, the best people to run your departments. And then allowing them to do what you paid them to do. 
He also believed in paying them um, not a particularly high salary, but great bonuses. And that bonus was always off of whatever the bottom line was. So if they did good for the company, then they did good in their own pockets in it. It got to the point where his executives were always paid more than any other executive on the strip, didn't matter where they were. So there was a great deal of loyalty involved in that um, because they knew if they worked hard, they, they were rewarded for it. Um, but so I think that's just kind of how that all came about. Excellent. So, so Mike, uh, you were one of those executives for uh, Bill Bennett. And so what was it like working for him, and why do you think he was so successful? Well, uh, Mr. Bennett had a great interest in how he dealt with his employees, whether it was the executive level or the people down on the, on the casino floor. Uh, as Diana pointed out, the, the bonus system was a very attractive thing in terms of me taking a job there and many of the people that went to work because he was exceptionally generous in terms of what he gave us as a bonus based on the performance of the company. But uh, he was as concerned about what the porter was getting in terms of some kind of recognition for what he was doing as he was those of us that were lucky enough to be executives. and. Uh, that came through. I mean, one time when there was a major uh, union strike in Las Vegas, uh, many of the properties uh, went for Me Too agreements while uh, over to Hilton or other places. And, um, you know, when, when uh, Circus was signed that, Mr. Bennett said, um, well, I don't think this is fair. I think we should pay the employees more. And... Uh, he actually gave more than he was required to under the contract of uh, the Me Too contract, and the employees could not get over it. They, by themselves, the union, uh, put up signs thanking Bill Bennett for taking better care of his employees than the companies where, that were making more money than we were. But I think he was one of the most remarkable people I was lucky enough to ever work with. He, was, he genuinely cared about his employees, and he was very generous to all of us who worked there. Perfect. Um, so, David, um, just to sort of wrap up this section of, you know, sort of the chronological section of this uh, story, um, really Circus Circus became the basis for, I guess, you know, it's a colloquial, but a, a casino empire, right? I mean, yeah. well, they built this, what had started out as a little circus tent kind of a casino into one of the biggest comp casino companies in the world. Yeah, not only that, if you look at how Las Vegas grew in the 1980s, a lot of it was because they borrowed the model that Circus Circus had, where the high end in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s took a hit, and a lot of casinos went to open it up and be more open to the middle market. So Bill Bennett was definitely ahead of his time in this and really formed not only a successful company, but inspired other companies as well. Well, and, and just to, uh, to uh, sort of complete the narrative, I mean, the, a lot of people, when they think of this sort of mega resort era in Las Vegas, they think of Steve Wynn, and you think of building the Mirage Hotel, which is, is true, but what, Mr. Bennett was right on his heels. Yeah. Well, we had uh, Excalibur, Luxor, and then in Mandalay Resort Group. I mean, this was a progression that was put in place, but he was very successful in uh, attracting and keeping really talented people, whether it was Tony Alamo or uh, Mike Henson or other people who would come in and help create what they did that company. I mean, we had those three properties lined up in a row there, and each was had a little different market niche, and that was uh, largely due to Mr. Bennett and to the people he recruited. But when, when they took over Circus, um, you have to understand that that's kind of at the time when the mob was somewhat at its best or worst, depending on how you look at it. And the licenses for almost all the ancillary properties, the the gift shop and the liquor store and all those were held by numerous mob members and Willie Cohen and Carl Thomas and uh, Spilatro. And so one of the first things he was bound and determined to do was to get all of them out of there. And he was told in no uncertain terms that he was to renew those contracts. And he said, we're not going to. And um, 
there were many a times we got the phone calls from the FBI that a hit's been put out on you. I'm going to make sure that you, you know, um, practice safe driving, don't take the same route to work every day, keep a big distance between the car in front of you, so there's always a way to get out. Um, and we all had to learn, you know, to go, go to school the same direction and everything else. So what does my father do? The first thing he does is he buys this fancy white Cadillac convertible <laughs> with bright red interior, um, to which we replied it looked like a pimp's car and he shouldn't drive it in the first place. Um, but he had several of his executives in the car and he's driving down the Las Vegas Strip and he hears what he thinks are gunshots. And um, so he swerves, he hits a light pole, wrecks the car, and all it was was backfire from some <laughs> other car. Nobody was shooting at him. Um, but he got rid of the car on that one. So, um, but it was, it was quite an endeavor, um, and he was very brave at that time to, to do what he did. Absolutely. Um... All right, very good. You know, one thing I want to ask you, Diana, before we finish, wrap this up, and you mentioned Mr. Pennington. Um, he was a, you know, we usually think about Bill Bennett first when we think about Circus Circus, but Mr. Pennington was a big part of this, at least in the early years. Yes, but Mr. Pennington's background was not really in the gaming business. He had a lot of other interests, but at one point he told my dad he wanted to run a casino. Um, so that's when they bought Circus Circus Reno, because Mr. Pennington lived in Reno, um, and Circus Circus Reno, that had been a big department store that they turned into a casino in downtown Reno. Um, and he did operate that for quite a few years, but um, it just really wasn't what his heart was in. Um, but he, yeah. was, he was more of a silent and partner than active. Okay, and just for, for the record, if you don't know, I mean, just as Circus Circus Las Vegas is still there, Circus Circus Reno is still there. I stayed there recently. <laughs> um, Jay, let's let's come back to you. Um, I, there, we've we've given a chrono chronological look at this story, but we've passed over uh, so many funny and interesting stories that are part of the Circus Circus story. Um, can we start by talking about the circus acts? Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um not only was it a way to, uh, you know, get entertainment, like we, at, at Caesars, I think we were paying Frank Sinatra $100,000 a, a week or something, and it was just, we had to find a way to do something that didn't have that kind of number attached. And so the, the circus entertainment model um, brought in ast astonishing talent, and it became a kind of a legend in the circus world because Circus Circus was the first place you could be a circus performer and you could get a job, buy a house, put your kids in school, settle down, and, take, and make roots. So we could, we could skim the cream off the circus world, and we had some of the best. In fact, I think we have a member of the Cavarettas here. Is Candace here? Hi. One of our performers from Worley In the back row in the middle. The, the amazing Cavarettas. <laughs> circus Welcome. Um, <laughs> and so I think I've been told by more than one circus person I've run into in years since that circus has a special place in the circus world as the, the, the best place to work if you were a circus performer. Um, and they were uh, uh, an interesting group of people. They sort of were family. They, they treated the place, you know, they were always coming in with something they baked or some, you know, and they were warm, and it was just a, it, it was a real fun environment to be around. And it was fun as a kid because the, the Canistrellis were like the best trampoline family, and they'd teach me and my sister how to jump on the trampoline, and, <laughs> um, and Yendus Maha had Tanya the Elephant, and... Uh, he taught me how to unload her and handle her and walk her, and you know, as soon as she got out of the trailer, she'd wrap her trunk around you, want to be scratched, and I, <laughs> I think she'd cuddle in your lap if you'd let her, you know. She, they, um, and so it, it was just a wonderful environment. From their perspective, it created an environment that was like no other in the world. You told me a little story about trying to do your homework. Oh, I was when I I had the bad habit of waiting till the last night to do term papers, and I I would always set up in my my dad's secretary's office because she had a Selectric typewriter with a back corrector. I had a Smith Corona piece of crap at home and it was terrible. So I would <laughs> sit my ass down there and start my homework. And we had a couple of clown acts and one of them were a, a couple of brothers from Spain and they were about this tall and this tall. And like a lot of circus performers, is 
they were on duty. They were clowns. That was their essence of their being at all times. And they'd come in and see me and say, oh, they'd start, oh, what are you doing? And they'd start picking my stuff up. Like, get, walk it off with my materials and, and like, <laughs> doing clown shit. It's like, get out of here. I'm doing homework. <laughs> and, you know, I, I was like, I'm the only kid in the world that's going to go to the teacher tomorrow and go, my paper's not done. I was harassed by clowns. <laughs> and and they go, well, we, for you, we believe this, you know. <laughs> right. um, the one kid in town. Yeah. So, Diana, you have a couple of stories, too, that are along these lines. You were uh, uh, telling me about getting uh, stuck in an elevator one time. Yes. We had Wrigley's Believe It or Not uh, Museum, and I was um, probably about six or seven months pregnant with my son, Todd, who's here. And there used to be an elevator that just went up to the executive level. So I was in the elevator, and I heard, hold the elevator, please, so I held it. And in walked the world's tallest man, the world's shortest man, and a set of conjoined twins. <laughs> now, I knew in my mind rationally that this could have no effect on my child. <laughs> but somehow in here, that didn't work. So I, I kind of put my arms around my belly, and in between the bottom floor and that very first floor, down I went, just passed out cold. Um, so it opens up on the executive level, and you know, here's the world's tallest man, the world's smallest man, and conjoined twins going, help, help, she's, <laughs> she's down. Um, yeah, so I've kind of had a phobia about little people ever since. And <laughs> circus, circus, that? no place for you. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, and, and another um, story you told me, and this is, you know, um, something, it, the way you describe it might not be as appropriate today as it would have been okay then, but you were talking about the Circus Circus was very popular with some people who would come to town once a year. Yes. If, if you've been in town a long time, and this is totally politically incorrect, so I apologize to anyone who might take offense with this. Having said that, um, many years ago, every October, the gypsies used to come to town. And you could count on it. They came and just in kind of rather giant swarms. And they really loved coming to circus because they loved the arcade level. Um, they were great pickpockets, and they could work that area very well. They also liked coming into the Pink Pony, and they had this trick of, Two of them would come and sit down, and then a third one would come, oh, I'm just joining them and sit, and a fourth, I'm just joining them and sit. Pretty soon you just have this, like, 30 people um, have taken over, like, just a couple of tables, and they've ordered two meals for the 30 people. But when they left, there was no longer any cream, no longer any sugar, no longer any salt and pepper. And so... One day, um, we had some people complaining there was a very bad smell on one of the floors. They were roasting a goat in the bathroom, in the bathtub. Um, so, yeah, it was never our favorite time at mid-October when the gypsies came. But I don't think they come anymore, but they did. <laughs> very good. Um, Mike, uh, working for Mr. Bennett, you, um, you know, talked a little, you've talked a little bit about how uh, you know, he he was a uh, he had certain feelings as a manager. He didn't like if an, an, he asked an employee what they were doing. He said, "I'm working on it," or "I'm working on something." Yeah. What? Did, how did that go down? Well, you're right. When and I had been warned by uh, Richard Bunker and somebody else uh, when I went in there that uh, Mr. Bennett, if he asked you uh, a question or wanted some information, uh, he, he was looking for. A, quick response that was a correct response and so I occasionally would slip and say well Mr. Bennett I, I'm, I'm looking into that and he would say no you're not tell me what the answer is and so I finally at one point um, said Mr. Bennett would you mind walking down the hallway with me to that lovely office you built for me because it had been Jay Sarno's office but mm -hmm. they turned it into a law library for me so I walked in and I said Mr. Bennett see See all these books that you put in here? I said, uh, that's where the answer is, and I can't remember everything that's in those 200 volumes. And he said, 
All right. <laughs> so the, that's how he was. But, you know, he, he was he wanted people to be responsible and responsive to what needed to be done. But when you explain to him, even under that circumstance, you know, he, he would occasionally uh, remind me that I should be looking at those books a little more carefully. But he, he was probably of the places I worked and with some of the colleagues I had in other properties, one of the most respected executives because of the way he was. I mean, don't forget, Bill Bennett, when the union uh, subsequently had the famous strike down at the frontier, um, and they were marching up and down the strip and all of this, it was Mr. Bennett decided that unilaterally our company would take the responsibility for feeding the employees who were not getting fed uh, as they were doing it. Now, whether or not there wasn't a vote on it, this was his decision. But, I mean, it was a very generous carrying decision, and I think it uh, helped uh, solidify the relationship that that company had for many years with the union employees because he had done something that was, he felt, necessary for his own employees. And he was that kind of a manager. I mean, he had uh, very good people involved with him, you know, whether it was Tony Alamo or Rick Bannis. I mean, he had found some excellent executives and gave them a great deal of latitude in how they would approach problems and they would consult with him before they you know, obviously implemented anything. But he was, he was a terrific executive. Uh, this is a question for, for Diana, but possibly for Mike and David as well. So uh, we've talked about Mr. Bennett mostly, but Mel Larson was a big part of this story too. Yes. And I mean, what, what was, would it be fair to say he was kind of like, he was the guy who got to go out there and do the, the, the marketing and the PR stunts for Circus Circus. Yeah. My father was really a rather private person and going to events, getting honors, yeah, he didn't want any of that stuff. But Mel Larson, you have to say he was Mr. Circus Circus. There was not a, it was, it was so embarrassing sometimes. This way. You'd go into a really fine restaurant and Mel, every waiter that came up, Mel would reach in that pocket and here's a Circus Circus key ring. Oh, wait a minute, you need a Circus Circus pin on your lapel and this one's got a flashlight. And by the time you left the restaurant, every person in there, every employee had a pin, had a hat. Had, I mean, he, he just kept taking things out of those pockets. <laughs> and, and, and when I was young, I used to find that kind of embarrassing. I thought, oh, my God, how's he doing that? But then you realized those people, when they came to Las Vegas, they were going to go to circus because of everything he had given them. He was a master <coughs> at it. He really was. Yeah, did you follow up on that? You'd get on an airplane going from Las Vegas to Reno or somewhere, and nine out of ten times you'd get on the airplane, there'd be people wearing that mm -hmm. pin that uh, Mel had given out. And, you know, he had the uh, car racing there and handled the public relations and did a great job. I mean, all of the, the, the people that he had performed very, very well, I think, in yeah. terms of the success of that company. And, David, uh, I think this is interesting context because one of the things that's interesting about Las Vegas history is how we kind of revere our public relations and marketing people in a way that probably no other city does. And, you know, whether it's the Las Vegas News Barrel photographers in the 50s or, uh, you know, the other promoters of, you know, entertainment acts on the strip or what have you, Mel Larson follows in that tradition, I would think. I think he does. And, you know, his enthusiasm is what made him able to do his job. He's not selling, you know, Frank Sinatra, you don't have to be a great marketer to sell Frank Sinatra. It's Frank Sinatra. <laughs> you know, to sell slot machines, I think you do have to be a great marketer. And that really is a testament to him and his ability. Absolutely. Um, Stan, I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about your old partner, Jay, and see if you can sort of give us some, maybe if you can, some insights into a couple of questions I have for you. One is... Uh, you know, you guys are very different people. Um, how did that work? And, and maybe it didn't work, but you stuck with him for years. Well, I don't know if it worked or not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we were involved, and I was involved. We couldn't break away. I was on many mortgages and notes and bank notes and loans and whatever. And it, it, it couldn't break away. Uh, he was a very impulsive guy, uh, kind of a showman, uh, did a lot of things, spoke a lot before he thought, got us in a lot of problems. Yep. Uh, 
I tried to be uh, some kind of an influence. Uh, Good luck with that. Yeah. But anyway, that was, uh, we were there and I was stuck in there and that was it. You know? <laughs> <Very> good. <laughs> um, so this brings us to, I think, the, uh, so the, the, the really fascinating part of this for me as a you know, longtime Las Vegan and a historian is the fact that we've imploded how many iconic resorts in Las Vegas, you know, from the Sands to the Dunes to the, now the Riviera, the Stardust. All these iconic resorts are gone, uh, you know, just maybe visible in the Neon Museum down the road or maybe a little, something here, memorabilia at the Mob Museum. But the Circus Circus uh, endures. Um, I want to ask each of you to talk about that, but Jay, maybe I'll start with you and get your thoughts on and why you think that might be. Well, I think the reason anything lasts a long time is because it, it evolves and it adapts, because the underlying, what makes a property successful today is no reason to believe it'll be successful 20 or 30 years down the road, because the environment around it changes. And circus, like any property that has achieved the 50-year mark, has evolved, and the first phase of its evolution was not simply required to keep up with the market, but simply to create some kind of equation that worked in the first place. And so as it transitioned from the, the original creator area, and you know, circus like no other property, I don't recall a time as a kid being in the hotel there weren't construction crews tearing something up, building something new, changing something around. It was, it was a property endlessly in search of a solution. And so as it transitioned into the, the Bennett and Pennington era, that, that automatically brought on this huge evolution of, uh, you know, it coincided with when the, the room inventory became large enough to support the property. And it evolved, and then over time, it continued to evolve. It had an RV park, you know. It, so the, the reason Circus continues is because it kept, it kept changing and reinventing itself. David, what do you think about that? I mean, it, it, this, is, this is your sort of bailiwick, right, the evolu evolution of Las Vegas. Um, circus has been made fun of in so many different ways over the years, and yet, you know, I think it made, for MGM uh, properties, it made $70 million in profit in 2016. What, uh, what's going on down there? I think it all comes down to what Las Vegas is and what Las Vegas should be, which is hospitality, making people feel welcome. And obviously, people feel very welcome at Circus Circus because it was such a property that was designed in a way to appeal to people. And I think it appeals to people's sense of fun. You know, you... Yeah, part of Las Vegas is the ultra luxury and the sophistication and stuff, and that's one layer of it. But I think at the core, people want to come to Las Vegas for fun, and it has to be accessible. And I think Circus Circus has done both for 50 years. Diana, do you have any, thought, any thoughts on that? Yes. Um, I think Las Vegas has this tendency to somebody starts something, and then the trend is everybody's going to do the same thing. So um, when Circus Circus became successful as being a family place, and we saw everybody up and down the strip um, build a roller coaster, build a theme park, do all of these things, and Las Vegas was no longer going to be Sin City, it was going to be Family City. And then we saw all of those places tear down their theme parks and their roller coasters, um, because every place shouldn't be a family center. But Circus was doing it, and it was doing it well. So as we've evolved, um, we've seen other trends. We've had all the nightclubs. You know, we've had one thing after another. Um, but Circus kept its core. It knew what it was good at, and it's continued to do it. MGM has not poured in a lot of money into it of late, and she looks a little tired. Um, but the premise is still the same. Kids still want to go there. Parents um, of whatever income know they can go there, and their kids are going to have a good time, and they can have fun. Um, and it's not going to cost them an arm and a leg. Everybody has a good time. And you still have all the opportunity to see everything else that's up and down the strip. So the premise of it worked in the beginning, and it still works now. Absolutely, and I just, you know, I think it's the, it's the only resort on the Strip that still has an RV park. 
uh, which is interesting. And and it, it has a theme a theme park, right? It has an adventure adventure mm -hmm. dome. One of our employees here uh, tonight worked at the adventure dome for many years before they came to the mob museum. So. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who've worked there and had connections there, and it, it, it really endures. Um, all right, so uh, before we, I, I want to open this up to the audience here in a minute. But uh, Jay, can you explain uh, what's sitting beside you <laughs> on the oh, table? I certainly. Um, opening up a hotel or a casino typically, you know, involves pretty elaborate invitations, and there was a, a second opening in '72 when the first 400-room <laughs> hotel tower went up, which I was there, I helped do it, it was a very chaotic process. But this was the invitation sent out to everyone, um, and it's a ceramic statue, and it has all of the specifics of the opening and what to do, and they threw a big party, and these were sent out, I don't understand how many of these sent out, probably a couple thousand of them, but these went out to uh, anyone and everyone that they thought might want to be, be part of this. Um, and this is uh, this is my brother's, actually, uh, <laughs> a few of us still have these uh, these, these uh, from 1972, from the hotel opening. Something tells me you wouldn't send out an invitation like that today. <laughs> <laughs> Took some money, yeah. All right, very good. So uh, why don't we throw this open? We have such a, a, an audience that ha comes from all different walks of life, and, and I hope you take a chance to uh, ask a question of this group. Um, so please raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll have our person come around. Um, let's start in the middle uh, on the second, in the second row. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know uh, when you guys um, opened the motor in, you know, how you had the motor in in the back, like the motel type part where you could drive in, you know, park right and walk right in. Um, when, when did that come about? When did that open? It's a Diana question. That was a, is that a Diana question? Maybe? Uh, yeah, it probably is, but I don't know the year. I think it was around 1980. Yeah, somewhere in there. I think so, yeah, 79, 80. And I think I think today see, uh, Circus Circus has something like 3,750 rooms. I mean, that's a lot of rooms. Yeah. But they come in all different sizes and <laughs> styles. Yeah. Price ranges. Uh, okay. Let's let's take this one. I'm sorry first, and then we'll take the one in the back. Thank you. Uh, for Jay, one of my first introductions to Circus Circus was early 70s James Bond diamonds are forever yeah. <laughs> so can you talk to me about that did they approach you did you approach them you were really an integral part of that film how did well, that all yeah, what, become I actually learned a little bit about that because I, I actually watched some of the filming um, in those days James Bond scripts were sort of outlines and they would send people out on location, based on the, where, where the, the, the story was located, and they would scout for people, places, and things that they could sort of on the fly, in an almost Im improv style, weave into the narrative of the basic script. And that's why you saw, I mean, those of us who were from Las Vegas thought it was hilarious when you saw somebody like running through the, um, cause the casino of one casino and they'd run out the door and they'd be outdoors of another casino, but you know, because you live here, you know that stuff. But they came to Circus and um, they saw all these different opportunities to sort of drive their, their story forward and they approached us. They approached my dad and said, Can we want to film here. And he did what he always does, which is, oh, you can't shoot a movie in here unless you put me in it. <laughs> and, uh, so if, if you ever look at Diamonds Are Forever, there is a scene in there where um, Jill St. John is trying to get away from some bad guys and she winds up uh, shooting a balloon in the the balloon thing with the water gun, and then she runs into this sideshow act. We had this grotesquely politically incorrect thing called Zambora the Gorilla Girl, and she <laughs> runs in there to escape the goons, and they do the performance of the mad scientist turning the girl into the gorilla, and my father is that mad scientist, <laughs> um, doing his little Yiddish funny voice, uh, and so we, and I stood in the room and watched them film that scene. So. Um, so that's how that's how circus got into that. It was just it was just good a good place for them to put that little piece of the story. Oh, they don't. I don't think they paid us any money. Uh, uh, it was just it was just a, a fun the thing. Publicity. Yeah, I don't think there was any money changed hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's take a question here. I'm curious about the carousel that predates Lucky the Clown, um, yeah. and if it is. What happened when it was taken out? Does it survive somewhere else? 
You mean the one out front where the sign was? Yes. yes. The, that original carousel. Oh, yes, I know it well. Um, but 1880 or 18... Stan, do you remember that carousel? It was from the 1800s. It was under the original sign. I'm, I'm sorry. You remember, the, you remember the original sign that had a carousel? Out? Yes. I don't know what happened. To oh, God. That thing was... Uh, it was almost 100 and some odd years old, 130 years old when we got it. And um, they used to let... Uh, charities like our high school drum club could come out there on the weekends and run it because it wasn't cost of, and so we'd run it but the clutch was destroyed so you had to we had to have enough people to push it to get it started <laughs> and um, I got that carousel started in the summer heat plenty of times so let me tell you but yeah we thought that finally and then the uh, above it was a, a marquee that was ring a ring marquee but that predated the current big clown that's out there mm -hmm. now uh, and it was next to the fountains, because, my, again, my dad's trademark design element. Oh, those fountains. Um, but I don't know where that... David, do you know? I have my, no idea. Uh, that's a I good question for the neon. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I have a picture of my daughter when she was one years old on it, um, which I treasure. It was gorgeous. I mean, all the horses were hand-carved. It was a real classic, amazing carousel. Well, you've given David and I some homework. We've got to find yeah. this carousel yeah. Yeah. now. <laughs> Bring it back. We'll put it in the parking lot of the Mob Museum. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> you can get it I started. think Lonnie Hammergren probably has one of those. Uh, <laughs> that's the first place we'll look. Yeah. We'll look. All right, another question. We have one over here. Mr. Mallon, all of us should look that good in our 90s, okay? I'm just telling you, all right? <laughs> If you would indulge me, please, sir. Your, your history with your partner is nothing short of uh, absolutely fascinating with the history of the town. Morris Lapidus, the famous architect, was in charge of, uh, was in the middle, not in charge, but in the middle of the Miami modern era. You and your partner made it to Miami and were tile contractors. And in the year the Sansui was built in 47, the Nautilus was built in 50, the Dolito was built in 51, the Biltmore Terrace in 51, the Algiers in 51. Wow. Then Mr. Novak and his partner, uh, Mr. Muffson, they went on to uh, uh, build the Fountain Blue, although Mr. Novak left Mr. Muffson out at the uh, signing table, is a famous thing. And then they built the Eden Rock, all right? From the Eden Rock, they turned around, and there was an interior designer named Joe Harris. And Joe Harris was a, uh, an intricate part of uh, what it appears is the development of your hotel skills in developing. And from Joe Harris, you guys went on, somewhere along the line, you met Mr. Hoffa. And then you built the cabana Atlanta. And then you built the uh, cabana in Dallas. And then you built the cabana in Palo Alto. And then you went on to build Caesar's Palace. Could you tell us about Mr. Lapidus? Did you work on those hotels in Miami? And then how did Joe Harris work into it? And then where did Mr. Hoffa come in? Joe Harris was in Atlanta. We met her in Atlanta. She, she worked on our motel there. We didn't do Lapid. We did Mel Grossman, who was an architect in Miami Beach. And he designed our, our hotel in uh, uh, Atlanta. And I think he did some work on uh, Caesar's Palace. Uh, what was the rest of your question? <laughs> that was a lot of questions. It was more of a, uh, a timeline as uh, how fascinating you and your partner's uh, adventure was through the 40s, 50s, 60s. And then where did you meet Mr. Hoffa along the way? Because obviously the Central States Teamsters Pension Fund, Mr. Beck went to prison in 57 for tax evasion. Mr. Hoffa became the president in 58. You guys borrowed money from the uh, Central States to build the three hotels. So how did Mr. Hoffa play into it? When we were building a, a motel in Atlanta, there was very few mortgagees. They, they did, not many lenders would loan. Our attorney at that time had done some work for the Teamsters, and he suggested that we go and uh, solicit them to, to loan. We met, we met with the union and their pension fund and uh, Hoffa, kind of took a liking to Sarno. <laughs> he gave us a nice loan, and uh, when we, be we built Caesars, he came to the opening. We, he made us a loan. We, he came to the opening, 
and all our money had gone out on markers. He gave us another million dollars that night. So uh, we had a very good relationship with the, with the Teamsters and Hall. Can I jump in? Yeah, go ahead, Jay. Um, if, are you, I'm sorry, Stan, are you? It's done. It's the architects often derive from their own prior work. They know they're not, they, they, we all go with what we know works. The three properties you described, the cabanas, the, the, the one in the one in Atlanta is gone. The one in Dallas became a low security prison, and it's now been it's now going back and been sold, and it'll go back to be restored to be in its classic cool cabana state. It's going to be a hotel once again. The one in Palo Alto has always been a hotel, and it's now called the Crown Plaza Cabana. And if you look at it. It is a miniature Caesar's Palace. It was the prototype mm -hmm. operational plan form of Caesar's Palace. It had the wings, the tower, the ring around the back, the pool. And that, that plan form was simply scaled up physically, and that became Caesar's Palace. So if you're a student of Caesar's Palace, you have to go see the, the, the prototype. It's in Palo Alto. And that information is all in David's book, which yeah. is a fascinating book. Mm -hmm. You should Thank get you. David, that's a, a, I was going to say just to give you a minute here to talk about architecture only because in Las Vegas because we I talk about earlier we venerate our you know our PR people our marketing people but architects in Las Vegas are, are an interesting story as well and certainly Sir Caesar's Palace and and to some extent Circus are plays into that. Yeah, it's fascinating, especially when you look at Caesar's Palace and how that's evolved over the years. But I think Circus Circus as well, starting out without the hotel was such a challenge. Adding the hotels over the years, I think, really helped it grow into a mega resort and helped it stay um, viable, which is why it's still here. And certainly the architects had a big share in that. All right, we have another question. We're in the second row over here. She's coming around. What is the history of Slots of Fun? Uh, was that built by Circus Circus? Were the two ever competitors uh, before uh, the two became joined as one? Yeah, it, wa it wasn't always part of Circus Circus, but they bought it because it was just a natural, because you could walk right through it. So instead of walking all the way down the sidewalk and into Circus, it made a whole lot more sense to walk into Slots of Fun and get your footlong hot dog and your 25 cent beer and then and that kind of loosened people up a little bit and <laughs> then they slid into circus and it seemed to be a, a perfect way to go. Uh, David, do you have the backstory on that a little bit or no? On Slots of Fun? Um, yeah, it, I believe they acquired it in 79. I could be off by a couple of years either way. But that was built by like another company that my yeah, dad had. Yeah. And they were he believed in the slot parlor model. He just thought slots were a better way to make money when left happened. Yeah. And he opened up two places, Slots of Fun, which remained, and another place called the Big Wheel Casino, which was in a little L shaped strip mall yeah. right on the on the uh, uh, north uh, western corner of Sahara, Sahara. Strip. Mm -hmm. And um, it was uh, it had a Ferris wheel. So, you know, now people talk about putting uh, you know, circus rides up on top of casinos. Well, there was a Ferris wheel down there we had years ago. And that place didn't make it, but lots of fun did, held on, and it's, it's, that's why it's still there. So it played off circus, circus played off it. It yep. was kind of a synergy that always worked. Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask Diana and, and Mike, uh, was it seen as a, as a thorn in the side of circus, or was it, was it a benefit? No, it was a benefit. I mean, it did its own little thing, but... Um, it, it was just a side that was a money maker. So. Okay. We have a question back here. Okay. So why were the hot dogs discontinued? <laughs> <laughs> what was it? So foot long, the foot long hot dogs. Oh, th th those were really good hot dogs. <laughs> I, no, I never fully ate one, but <laughs> it's like a it's like a whole meal. Um, but they were great hot dogs, and the beer was always kept on ice right there, so the beer was always super cold. Okay, but how come they're not there anymore? I you would have to ask MGM that. Okay. I, would, I wouldn't have an answer. Right. I had one. Did you? Yeah, never again. Yeah, <laughs> they were a big draw. 
I, you know, and by the way, I'm not sure they're not there. I, I think they they still have some small concession that's lots of fun. We might have hot dogs. It's a subway now. Oh, subway. Oh, yuck. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> not that I hate subway or anything. Subway's fine. Just doesn't seem the same. Why don't we take one more over here? Um, the back row. The steakhouse over at Circus Circus lives as a legend. <laughs> my favorite place. There, probably in the 80s. It reminded me I was waiting for Frank Sinatra to walk in. And uh, I was there last year, and I was still waiting for Frank Sinatra to walk in. <laughs> However, mm. though, the food, Me too. the food by far is quick. the best Story in Las Vegas. One of, the, one of the highlights still out here. That steakhouse will always be the top. Yep. Yeah. It's hard to beat that steakhouse. So speaking of that, though, that is sort of antithetical to everything else, right? It's like... If you're looking for something at the higher end or something really elegant, you go to the steakhouse at Circus Circus, right? And that's still true. Mm -hmm. But um, what was the, what's the genesis behind that? Do you know Jay or Diana? That came along in a different era. That's a, yeah. that no. an era question. He, he had, had the steakhouse when we opened. Well, we had yeah, but it wasn't where it was now because that was a different uh, physical layout. Was it up where the gourmet room was? At one time, they had the most amazing gourmet room. Yes. Yeah. Bon vivant, yes. Yeah, it was an amazing room. And then they had the steakhouse. Um, I remember the steakhouse being built, uh, but it was decided that the gourmet room just, we just didn't have enough of that clientele to keep the gourmet room going open. The executives ate there all the time, but not a lot of other. So we want to wrap up. Um, Jay has a, a story to leave us with. And then we're, just a reminder that after uh, we're done here, we're going to head down to the speakeasy. Uh, first of all, Diane is going to have books for anyone who wants a, a great biography of Bill Bennett. Uh, but then after that, we're going to head down to the speakeasy. David's going to have his book signing. There's discounts on drinks. There's uh, great fun down a couple of floors. Jay, take it away. When I was uh, working there, I just right after I turned 15 years old, um, somebody mentioned uh, Willie Cohen, who was a casino host and uh, one of these uh, interesting connected people who was there. <laughs> and he, we, he was walking through one of the back hallways one time and coming out of the side entrance into the, um, the theater. We had a, a theater there called the Hippodrome, about a 400-seat theater. And he smelled smoke and he ran in and what had happened is a series of very high-powered high stage lights had been laid up against one of the intermediate stage curtains that was down. And it... it got it so hot it ignited it and the entire curtain was on fire and he went and ran to the uh, and then the alarms went off and he went and got one of those cabinets that opened it and turned the water on and came out and he he actually put out the, the the fire before it spread and the entire curtain and i ran in there and a bunch of people ran in there and eventually the fire department showed up and this entire curtain was gone save for this one little tiny corner about, about the size of a piece of paper and on it was a tag it's the most ironic things I've ever seen. It said, New York Fireproof Curtain Company. <laughs> <laughs> the tag was saved. So just the tag was fireproof. All right, very good. Well, uh, uh, please, uh, a round of applause for our great panel. We're going um, to wake, wake our way downstairs, and if you have additional questions for Jay or anyone who uh, is able to stick around, uh, they'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. See you there. Yep. Nice job. I got my little thing. <laughs>